name is Sarah Kamel on behalf of my co-authors from Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'd like to present the work from our manuscript entitled Minimally Invasive Ultrasound Guided Carpal Tunnel Release Improves Long-Term Clinical Outcomes in Carpal Tunnel Syndrome. Our disclosures can be seen on this slide. Senior author LNN discloses his role on the Medical Advisory Board of 10X Health. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common peripheral entrapment neuropathy. It has been reported to affect approximately 3-5% of the general population, and 65% of those affected will have bilateral symptoms. The estimated economic burden as a result of carpal tunnel syndrome is reported as $2.7 to $4.8 billion per year due to time away from work as a result of disability from carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a diagnosis which is made clinically and often confirmed with electrodiagnostic testing. Imaging is helpful to confirm enlargement of the median nerve and to exclude a structural abnormality which may be contributing to the symptoms. Treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome involves transection of the transverse carpal ligament. Um, and in order to decrease postoperative pain and disability following surgery, there has been a trend away from traditional open surgical treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome and towards endoscopic treatment of transecting the transverse carpal ligament. Additionally, there has been development of several ultrasound guided techniques which have shown an earlier return of hand function postoperatively. The purpose of our study was to evaluate the long-term clinical success of ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel release and improving function and discomfort in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. This was a retrospective review conducted of 61 ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel release procedures which were performed on 46 patients. 15 patients had bilateral procedures. Questionnaires were administered regarding pain and functional ability of the hand. Um, these included the quick disabilities of the arm, shoulder, and hand, also known as Q-dash, and the Boston Carpal Tunnel Syndrome Questionnaire, which has two components, the Symptom Severity Scale and the Functional Status Scale. These questionnaires were administered pre-procedure and at two weeks post-procedure. Patients were also contacted a minimum of one year following the procedure to answer the same questionnaires. A paired Wilcoxon sign ring test was used to evaluate and compare pre-procedure and post-procedure questionnaire scores. Patients meeting clinical inclusion criteria for the study had to have a clinical diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome as determined by their referring provider. Their symptoms had to be refractory to conservative management for at least six months. Patients had to be able to give informed consent for the procedure and return to clinic for a two-week follow-up and if a coagulopathy was present, it had to be correctable prior to the procedure. Imaging inclusion criteria for the study included no structural abnormality contributing to compression of the median nerve as determined by our ultrasound evaluation preoperatively. Additionally, the recurrent motor and palmar cutaneous branches had to arise from the radial side of the median nerve as the transection device is positioned ulnar to the median nerve and injury to these structures should be separate from that in order to avoid injury. The transverse safe zone and longitudinal safe zones will be described in the next few slides and criteria for these safe zones had to be met for the procedure to be performed safely. Other than that, any other variant anatomy such as a bifid median nerve did not prevent the patient from undergoing the procedure so long as the transverse safe zone and longitudinal safe zone was met. The transverse safe zone was defined as the shortest distance between the ulnar border of the median nerve and the radial border of either the hook of the handmate or the ulnar artery, whichever was closer. And this had to be at least greater than zero millimeters, meaning that the ulnar artery could not be draped directly above the median nerve in order for the procedure to be performed safely. The longitudinal safe zone was defined as the distance between the distal extent of the transverse carpal ligament and the superficial palmar arch, which is circled in the image above. And this had to be at least two millimeters for the procedure to be performed safely, for the hook device to be anchored over the transverse carpal ligament without risk of injury to the superficial palmar arch. All procedures were performed under local anesthetic only and in an outpatient ultrasound radiology clinic. They were performed using either a 14 or 15 megahertz linear transducer, and the device used was called the SX-1 Micronife device by Sonex Health 
and is pictured here below. To prevent iatrogenic injury during manipulation, the device features a retractable hook blade housed within an inflatable balloon seen at the tip of the device here. The hook blade is deployed and re retracted to then transect the transverse carpal ligament by the lever denoted by the arrowhead here. A stopper is available to prevent inadvertent advancement of the device beyond the longitudinal safe zone. And the balloon, the protective balloon, is inflated with saline by compressing the lever and the handle here. And that's to help separate and widen the transverse safe zone, separating the ulnar artery and the median nerve, again, preventing injury of those structures. Following administration of local anesthetic, the next step of the procedure uh, involves using a uterine dilator to dissect deep to the transverse carpal ligament within the tra transverse safe zone in order to loosen any adhesions between the transverse carpal ligament and the carpal tunnel structures prior to placement of the transection device. This is a short axis grayscale image of the carpal tunnel following insertion of the transection device and inflation of the protective balloon denoted by the letter B seen on both sides of the cutting edge denoted by the arrow. This device at this time is positioned within the transverse safe zone, ulnar to the median nerve represented by the dotted circle, and deep to the transverse carpal ligament denoted by the asterisk. Inflation of the balloon displaces the median nerve radially and protects the components of the carpal tunnel from iatrogenic injury during transverse carpal ligament resection. This is a longitudinal view of the transection device inserted into the safe zone deep to the transverse carpal ligament. The hook knife of the device can then be deployed as demonstrated in the cine clip and then retracted to minimize inadvertent neurovascular injury. Next is a cine clip image in the transverse position over the carpal tunnel moving from distal to proximal demonstrating the device hook knife, which is the acogenic device in the center of the image with resulting shadowing, transecting the transverse carpal ligament. This is imaged in short axis to maintain view of the median nerve, which is seen immediately deep and on the left side of the image relative to the location of the hook knife. On the left is a cine clip demonstrating the integrity of the transverse carpal ligament after the uterine dilator is inserted and prior to transection of the transverse carpal ligament. Um, on the right is a sonographic cine clip uh, with the uterine dilator positioned back within the transverse safe zone following transection of the transverse carpal ligament, um, demonstrating that the transverse carpal ligament can be completely probed and successful transection was achieved. So again, 46 patients and 61 risks met clinical and imaging criteria and had the procedure performed. These included 25 women and 21 men. The mean patient age was 60.7 and they ranged from 21 to 80 years of age. 87% or 40 out of the 60 patients were successfully contacted a median of 1.7 years following the procedure to complete long-term follow-up questionnaires. The trend in median questionnaire score preoperatively at two-week follow-up and at long-term follow-up can be seen in these box and whisker plots with the Q-dash score on the left and the Boston Carpal Tunnel score on the right. Um, questionnaire scores demonstrated a statistically significant decline at two-week follow-up compared with preoperative score and at long-term follow-up compared with preoperative score for all questionnaires. The majority of surveyed patients reported to be satisfied or very satisfied with the procedure, and that included 83% of patients at two-week follow-up and 93% of surveyed patients at long-term follow-up. Among the patients reporting dissatisfaction or neutral feelings regarding the procedure at long-term follow-up, all had initially presented with mixed symptoms of clinically diagnosed carpal tunnel syndrome. In addition to underlying systemic conditions, all were aware that the procedure may not be successful, however, elected to undergo the procedure regardless. One patient had Parsonage-Turner syndrome, one had chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, and the third had myasthenia gravis. 
A possible explanation for rapid recovery times in our study cohort may relate to the size of the incision, which is approximately 4 to 5 millimeters in our study population, as compared with reports of 5 to 40 millimeters in the literature with endoscopic or open surgical technique. This is an image of a 52-year-old female patient with long-standing persistent symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. Postoperative sub photos submitted by this patient at three days postoperatively on the left and at long-term follow-up on the right demonstrate excellent healing of the 4 millimeter incision used for the ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel release. No patients in this study cohort experienced an immediate postoperative neurovascular com complication. However, two patients did require referral to surgery at the post-procedure follow-up time. One patient suffered from a mechanical fall, which resulted in an open wound at the site of incision. Uh, the patient eventually presented with symptoms concerning for infection and required open surgical washout for MRSA. The second patient underwent prolonged use and an injury to the wrist while playing racquetball approximately eight days postoperatively, and this resulted in acute onset of wrist pain, paresthesias, and swelling concerning for compartment syndrome. This patient underwent surgical exploration, which demonstrated compression of the median nerve by fascia in the distal forearm, and this fascia was subsequently resected. Limitations of this study include the fact that all procedures were performed by a single physician with considerable experience in musculoskeletal intervention. However, our questionnaire scores at two-week follow-up are consistent with data in another study using this similar ultrasound guided technique. Additionally, there's been previous work demonstrating that there's been no difference in technical success of ultrasound-guided transverse carpal ligament resection in two operative operators with different levels of experience. Another limitation is that long-term follow-up was performed over the phone rather by an in-person assessment with physical exam correlation and imaging evaluation. Another limitation is that there was no direct comparison with patients who underwent open or endoscopic carpal tunnel release and further studies are needed with longitudinal follow-up and cost analysis to determine if this procedure should be integrated into the standard treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome, refractory to conservative management. In summary, ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel release can be performed safely with high patient satisfaction and significant long-term relief from carpal tunnel syndrome. Patients had marked clinical improvement as early as two weeks postoperatively and 93% of patients surveyed after one year were satisfied or very satisfied with their outcomes. In conclusion, ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel release quickly improves hand function and reduces hand discomfort with persistent improvement beyond one year. Ultrasound-guided carpal tunnel release may be a safe, effective, and less invasive alternative to traditional open or endoscopic surgery, particularly in patients for whom traditional surgery may be high risk or contraindicated. Thank you for your time and attention, and thank you to the AJR for this wonderful opportunity.